Okay, moving along. I think I got the first part of our ranting now. I'll continue later because I think now we got to prepare to introduce our guest. Oh, that's Very, right. Probably the biggest guest we've ever had. No, I don't know, dude. I, I don't know. I, you know, I, no, I, I, I'm with you. Very huge guest, but I think Zahn might be a little bit more, if not the same level. I mean, this is Tim Zahn we're talking about, you know? True, but Steve Sansui is, was, oh, well, was, out of the, the most, was the most recognizable face. And Lucasfilm. He is the director of fan relations. He is, other than George Lucas himself, he's the most recognizable face there. He's written the encyclopedia. He's written a lot of books. He's the biggest Star Wars and director. He has the museum. Say it, say it, say it. Right. He is amazing. Obi Wan. Awesome. Awesome. I don't see why. T- Timothy's on wrote a lot of books, but Steve Sansweet has his hands everywhere. Yeah, that dude really is like the heart. I think that I think that makes him a little bit bigger than Timothy's on. Just a tad. Plus, Timothy Zahn's interview, he has got uh, attention, had a couple sites retweet it, but this interview coming up, there's at least four major sites that are looking forward to it and want to hear it. Well, dude, of course. I mean, dude, I, I'm sorry, Rancho Obi-Wan. That just, to me, is like, oh, 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 Star Wars nerdgasm. And we can ask him all sorts of stuff. Plus, he was the head of fan relations. He, no one knows Star Wars fans better than him. Dude, no one. He, I don't think anybody knows Star Wars better than he does next to George. Uncle George, we love you. Oh, if and that ladybug has been on that cup all damn day. In fact, that ladybug was on that cup at two in the morning. This ladybug, it's like living on this pink cup we have on the railing. And I'm not gonna move it because it's like bad looking stuff. I see. For you guys, the listeners of Bombad Radio, that's right, our loyal bombardiers, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. My personal pick for today, for this episode, check this out. It's called Area 51 by Annie Jacobson, an uncensored history of America's top secret military base. Now, listen, for those of you out there who uh, are aware of Mac Manto, yeah, you know who I'm talking about. And for those that don't, you can check it out. I'll explain it. But basically what this book is, this book is completely uncensored, actual interview and testimony with people that actually worked at Area 51 from its inception, from all the declassified documentation from like 2007, 2008. And this gives a really, really good overview on things like uh, the U-2 spy plane, the A-12 ox cart, which you might know as the SR-71 Blackbird, how Area 51 was born, nuclear testing, all that kind of crazy stuff. Very good read, highly recommended. Go to audible.com, check it out. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com backslash bombadradio. Again, audibletrial.com backslash bombadradio for your free audiobook. Now keep in mind, if after the trial you choose not to keep using audible.com, no big deal. You can still keep the free audiobook download. It's yours to keep forever on whatever you want to put it on. So go check it out. Give it a try. See what you think. Guaranteed you're going to love this service. Welcome to the show. Hello, how are you guys? We are doing just great. Can you hear us just fine? Yes. Hey, uh, it's an awesome to meet you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, holy crap, really? I'm like, this is awesome. Hey, am I talking to you, James? Yes, I'm uh, James. James here, and I'm Jeremiah. Yeah, Jeremiah sounds like it, it sounds like you're in a deep cave somewhere on the other side of Tatooine. Yes. He um, how about a third floor of a building here on campus? Yes, oh, basically, okay. he's, he, he's in a lunch room in a college campus. So basically, I mean, I'm studying from Obi Wan. Okay. No, no, I'm dude, in house. dude, you're basically <laughs> in the equivalent of a Sarlacc pit. Oh my, that's messy. Oh my, it does smell sometimes in here. Yeah. See? <laughs> and every now and again, you get a random tongue that you don't know where it came from. <laughs> that is true. Okay, so we have a we have a mix of questions from our fans and from ourselves. 
Um, I had the pleasure of meeting you at Celebration, but most of our listeners did not, because Celebration, not everyone can go. So. so we have a good mix of questions from our fans and ourselves. Sounds great. Uh, and hopefully we can get to all of them. <laughs> so I guess the first question we have, this one comes from uh, one of our listeners. Uh, they said, since you began in journalism, which is one story you would like to have ha you uh, would like to have covered in history? Wow, that's that's a very good one. Um, my, what? Yeah, that's that's yeah. Wow, like, dude, being, did we really have to lob that at him? <laughs> that's he does he, he does interviews all the time so might as well throw yeah. ones at you that you don't usually answer yeah no because i've never been asked that before let me see let my uh, let, let my body sort of regress in time and um i i guess you know i guess being there for a momentous event that that changed the world i mean talking you know it's since i've just seen lincoln not too long ago you know the assassination of the president um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm old enough to remember all the news on, on the assassination of, of JFK and, and how that was handled and how one reporter in particular from United Press International just off the top of his head dictated the most amazing gut wrenching story that, you know, that was so good. It didn't have to be changed much for the final newspapers. Um, that and frankly, I always wished that I had been a reporter on on just one of the Apollo space missions. So you know, all kinds of things. Mm, space, wow, that's fantastic. So most people know you as the former head of fan relations with Lucasfilm, the number one Star Wars collector in the world, despite what the Guinness Book of World Records says, um, owner of Rancho Obi Wan, and so on. So. What started? What um, inspired you, or started you uh, collecting Star Wars memorabilia? Well, you know, I grew up with um, science fiction all my life. Uh, uh, a good friend of my folks, who lived on the same street in Philadelphia, was one of the early members of the science fiction book club, which just celebrated its 60th anniversary, and he used to pass me along the books after he would read them. Sometimes they would be big picture books and sometimes they would be novels from, you know, some of the names that have now become the classic names in science fiction, like Asimov and Pole and, um, and I would read them and I just got, got blown away. So I started watching some of the cheesy early TV shows and, and, you know, got some of the, like, the Tom Corbett Space Fort and all those cool things. And then I grew up. And, you know, back back then when you were, you know, 12, 13, 14, you, you didn't play with toys anymore. It's not what people did. And there was no video and there were no video games. So that all sort of, you know, went out the window. I did still build and uh, build, buy and build model kits which were mostly rockets and uh, both real world and and fantasy and then years passed and I, I i got connected again from a story i did in the wall street journal about antique toys and one of the guys i interviewed said well you know what the new hot thing is going to be and brought out a case of, of plastic robots and uh, and i got hooked and so i started buying space toys and then Star Wars came out, and I really got hooked. But that's that's sort of how it all started. There was that background there. Nice, nice. And for the record, I got my first Star Wars novels from the Science Fiction Book Club. So did I, actually, come think of it. <laughs> you know, dude, Science Fiction Book Club, can't go wrong. Oh, and they're still around, and they still do a great job, and it's just... Still, we're getting we're getting some static from someone. Mm. Uh, is it you, James? No, it's not me, brother. Hmm. Not me, I don't think. I think it's from a college camp myself. Oh no, well, actually, see, I'm, I'm muted most of the time. The only one that I hear breaking up is Mr. Sansweet. Hear me breaking up? Just a tad. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not that sad. <laughs> 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 I think we're going to keep that in. Oh, nice. I absolutely agree. <laughs> okay, well, here, I have a question. Okay. okay, yes. My question is this. What was the first Star Wars, like, piece of Star Wars memorabilia you ever bought 
and do you still have it? That I ever bought or that yeah, like I he, ever, got. ever got? Okay, ever got. Let's say different. ever got. There's a difference. True, true. I apologize. <laughs> well, you should. And and I have. <laughs> <laughs> the, first, the first piece that I that I got was um, a beautiful color brochure that Fox and Lucasfilm put together. They were desperate to get um, movie theater bookers to book Star Wars. Nobody was interested in this. I mean, there hadn't been science fiction films since the 50s, except for 2001, which was great in its own way, but didn't make back any money, didn't make back its budget. And so, like, they could care less about a boy, a girl, a universe, et cetera, et cetera. So they did this wonderful color brochure, sent it out to the movie theater bookers, and they also sent it to the media. And at that time, uh, somebody else uh, covered uh, the entertainment industry for the Wall Street Journal. I was in the Los Angeles office, and he got this package, and I saw the Star Wars wrap on it, and he opened it up. And I sort of walked past his desk and slobbered a little as I looked over his shoulder. And um, <laughs> and he wasn't – you had to be careful, and, and – he wasn't the kind of guy that you could just outright ask something from at the time. And um, next thing I knew, he dumped it in his wastebasket. And uh, luckily, he did not have a messy lunch. And when he left for the day, I sort of tiptoed over to the wastebasket, made sure no walking, and it was my first dumpster dive. All right. And I have you had to dumpster dive since? Oh, many times. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it, it's it's saving it's saving history for humanity and fandom, and yes. of course, I still have that piece. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, that is yeah. so cool. So, uh, another question from inside the Sarlacc pit on Tatooine here. Uh, this one's from a fan. It says, "With writing, I just as soon kiss a Wookiee." The quotable Star Wars. Which Star Wars quote is one that relates to you um, the most? Uh, I think that would really have to be Yoda, and and I really think it's a magnificent quote, um, do or do not, there is no try. And I really have tried to, uh, <laughs> that was the wrong thing to say, I really have used that in my life. I haven't tried to do that because there is no try. But yeah, that's a, that's a quote that really, um, really resonated with me and still does. That's a good quote. Although that is a very good quote. You know, Jeremiah, we have an impromptu question from uh, Il Duce, my fiance, and she would like to know. Her first name is Il, and her last name is Duce. I was actually thinking about asking her to legally change her name to that because she really is like Mussolini with boobs. Oh no! Oh. Um, I I love her to death. <laughs> I moved from New Jersey to Tennessee for the woman. Okay, that's good. Yeah, exactly. I went from like civilization to like a mountain. No, Tennessee's a great state. I have a lot of friends in Tennessee. There's oh, a, cool. a big, big contingent of five first uh, folks and very nice folks. Really? I'll have yep. to find them. Yes, you will. <laughs> I must find the 501st now that I know. But she, she would like to know, with your passion for Star Wars, I think the exact quote was, do you have a passion for the dark side or a love of the light side? Hmm. It's a good question, and I think uh, sometimes it's uh, all according to uh, which side of the bed uh, uh, I, I, I get up uh, in the morning from. Um, I really would have to say since, you know, when I first saw Star Wars, it, it, I identified with Luke Skywalker because of his yearning to leave home. And, and I had felt the same thing. I had escaped from Philadelphia, which is not a bad city. It's just that I needed to leave all of that growing up stuff and, and, and move away. Um, and then later in life, I identified with Obi-Wan and as the mentor and as as the guy who sort of brought the, who started the journey for for Luke. Um, and yet and yet the the baddies are always the most exciting. The, the you know, the, the girls love the bad guys. And um, so there's something to say for the dark side, but uh, and I am a member of the 501st and not yet a member of the Rebel Legion, but 
my time will come someday, and I, I think I would pick the the light side over the dark side if I had no, to. No, come to the dark side. We have cookies. Yes, I know, and milk, and just all kinds of good stuff. Oh, absolutely. We got them chocolate chip ones, and the good ones that don't look like oatmeal raisin cookies that trick you. Ah, uh -huh. ah, that's the key. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I said the dark side usually has cooler costumes. Well, we'll just go with that. Oh well, I mean, Dude, yeah, Darth that's, why, Vader. that's why the five. Yeah, that's why the five oh first uh, sort of took off so much. Everybody wanted to be a, a stormtrooper or Vader, and and now there's so many different Darths, uh, you know, from expanded universe and and Darth Maul, and the, yeah, the the costuming's amazing. But there's some very cool uh, rebel costumes too. So I I can't play favorites. Mm. This summer, I actually, um, I, I work at a camp, and uh, we it's a space theme this year, and so on Fridays, we get to wear costumes, and I'm trying to figure out which Star Wars costume my, my wife and I will be wearing, and we're, we keep on getting into arguments of what we want, because it's Alaska, so there's mosquitoes, but at the same time, though, you know, it's Star Wars, so we can be anything, and so we're just trying to figure out what costumes. I think I've decided on, like, an X-Wing or an Echo Trooper, but she keeps on tempting me with these other costumes that she liked me better, and I'm like, ah, oh, Dude, well, I think you'd make a pretty good Han Solo. Han Solo and the princess. Oh, no, they're mosquitoes. She could not be Slave Leia, no. no yeah, but she, no, that, not yes, in Alaska. <laughs> that's true, but she, you know what? Because if there's mosquitoes and it's wet, she could always go with uh, Endor Ground Force version of Leia because, you know, Poncho. That is true. And one thing we were tempted is um, I can go uh, Imperial Officer and she can go Imperial Officer as well and be like Dala. Yeah. So, yeah. No, yeah, but, but the cool thing is, though, but dude, if you went, if she went as that lady, then you could go as the version of Han that has that really cool trench coat. True. The, the trick is finding the costume or being able to make the costume right. Right. That's the trick. Yeah. So now we have a, a few questions about being head of fan relations, which I guess the first thing we'll ask is, when did you officially start being head of fan relations, and how did you get that position in the first place? Well, it just sort of happened. It's actually a job title that I never really had, but sort of made up. I mean, I was hired as director of specialty marketing at Lucasfilm, which meant that uh, it was a one-year job, basically, to go around to a bunch of fan conventions and... You know, explain to fans what the special editions were all about and a little bit of Shadows of the Empire was to get people excited for the special editions. And um, and then they forgot to fire me, so I just sort of was there for another 14 years. Go uh, for it, bro. <laughs> yeah. So my job then, my job title then changed to um, Director of Content Management, and that meant that I was responsible for devising the strategy for the rollout to all our different audiences of uh, of episodes one, two, and three, and making sure that the fans were served by, um, you know, really, you know, getting photos and early stuff without giving anything away until we get a lot closer to the launch of the movie, that, that we had photos out there behind the scenes and a little bit of information and that the the fans were always the first to know um and and out of that i mean lucasfilm has a storied history of of appealing to the fans and it goes back to 1976 partly out of desperation partly out of the fact that the head of publicity and marketing and merchandising was a comic book geek and had been to some of the early comic book conventions and so in 1976 Lucasfilm was the first company and remained the only company for decades to go directly to the fans and let them in on what Star Wars was all about. People think, oh, this is a big secret. Nobody knew anything about. Well, they were at San Diego Comic-Con in 1976 at Worldcon in Kansas City. And they, they had displays of the costumes. They had um, they had some clips. They had, you know, the stills from the set. Um, so, yeah, Lucasfilm was very smart about that. They continued that with an in-house fan club and magazine until um, the late 80s, and then it, then it was outsourced licensee. And, you know, I, I sort of saw it as one of my missions to, to get that thing going again, and, and I followed in some amazing footsteps uh, to do that. And, that, and that's really what you know, people know me for and and what my my outside uh, persona has been because I went I continued going to fan co uh, conventions for all those years and trying to get 
some of the coolest stuff uh, to to share with fans. And uh, I enjoyed that immensely. I've gone around the world for Star Wars and met thousands of people and uh, and just so many of them that I can really, really call friends. So, so, um, so, envious. so one little question for me before I do another full question. So were you responsible then for the, the Star Wars um, fan club that was included in all the little toys in the 90s? Well, the in the two thousands, the the fan club at that point, it's, it it was taken over by a guy named Dan Madsen, who had started the um, a company called Fantastic Media with uh, a Star Trek a magazine and fan club. And Dan was a, a wonderful steward from uh, eighty seven through uh, episode one. And uh, then things got a little complicated. Uh, we did the first celebration, uh, Dan and and his number two, um, John Bradley Snyder and I and Anthony Daniels really sort of cobbled together the first celebration, which we finally recall as Mudstock, since we just had 50-year rains in Denver and we were intense that week. But otherwise... Um, and, and so, uh, and so, you know, that's where it started. And then, uh, over the years, the license changed hands. And then at, at one point we brought it back to Lucasfilm and, and that's where we reinstituted the membership kits internally. It was always important to me to sort of have that both for the, for the new Star Wars fans coming along with, uh, Clone Wars and as a bit of nostalgia for uh, for the older fans, and um, and it, and it worked out well until uh, Lucasfilm made the decision to uh, shut down the fan club. Mm. But I, I did want to say though, I actually have a couple of copies of that of the old uh, magazine from the uh, '80s in a box at my parents' house. Uh huh. Yeah. No, I, I have to get them. I don't even remember which ones they were, but I know they're there. Yeah, those were cool. At first, it was um, it was just called, I think, the Star Wars magazine. And then after about four issues, we all sort of uh, brainstormed and came up with the name Star Wars Insider, and that has uh, stuck. So um, that's yeah, those good. ones I have, the ones that are labeled Star Wars Insider. Yeah, and now the original newsletter was called Bantha Tracks. It was unnamed for about four or six issues, and then a fan named that. And um, and that went on for 36 issues, I think, as a uh, mostly as a quarterly. And then um, and then the Star Wars magazine and then Insider. Insider is now in the able hands of Titan Publications, which is actually based in the UK. And that's where the magazine is put together and edited. But that's the UK and the US edition are one and the same. Well, it does make sense. I mean, after all, they did a lot of the filming in the UK. Yeah, that's for sure. And who? And uh, Jonathan Wilkins does a, a really good job with Star Wars Insider. He absolutely. Jonathan is a, a, such a pleasure to work with. One of my jobs at Lucasfilm was um, working with a guy named Jonathan Rinsler, who's an editor of Lucas Books, uh, to uh, do the final in-house edit and look at uh, Star Wars Insider. I mean, that was one, one of my jobs from practically the the start. And uh, uh, working with Jonathan Wilkins is great. He gets it. He's a huge fan and comes up with great ideas. And so that's that's been a real pleasure. So uh, I've always enjoyed that. So as head of fan relations and um, content creator, uh, what are some of uh, the ideas that you passed up the tree or put out there that you feel are uh, were most prominent to Star Wars or your biggest contributions to Star Wars in that position? Well, I think celebration would be one of the main things and, and keeping celebration going despite some um, some real difficulties. My boss at the time, who was uh, vice president of um, marketing, uh, said, you know, we really need to do something you know, to, to really get the fans on board and let them know that we're thinking about them as a prelude to launching episode one. And, you know, how about, you know, and then he came up with some crazy ideas. Why don't we do a little fan event in 10 major cities the same weekend? <laughs> and, and I said, uh, Jim, uh, that's in the realm of, you know, I don't like to say no, but I think that's in the realm of the impossible. You know, we could do something like uh, every weekend in a different place. But how about, you know, 
one big thing that we could do that people would come to. And at that point, the fan club had also been thinking of, of you know, what can we do to mark uh, the launch of uh, episode one, a whole new Star Wars. And um, and so Dan and I and John talked and we came up with um, the idea of one big event, which they wanted to do in Denver because that was where the home of the fan club was and it would be necessary to spend a lot of time on the ground in advance, et cetera. And, and then the, and then we had a list of about 30 or 40 or 50 different names. I mean, we just thought of everything. Um, you know, at one point it was going to be the star Wars fan fest. And, but, um, but I think it was John actually um, who came up with a celebration, and it just it sounded right to us. Of course, in retrospect, geez, what else would you call it? Um, but, yeah, really, uh, that, nothing else would sound right, would it? The Star Wars Jamboree. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> I think a powwow. All right, everybody. Yes, Wars that's powwow. what I was going to say. The Star Wars powwow. That's great. <laughs> It's the same thing I got asked by the by the head of publishing early in the 90s before I joined Lucasfilm and they were just starting up the publishing division. And she said, well, you know, we have to come up with a name like, you know, Star Trek has the Trekkies or Trekkers. And, you know, we need to come up with a name like that for Star Wars fans. And I said, no, that has to, you know, that has to be grassroots. That has to be what people call themselves. Although... In Germany, they call themselves the Star Warslers, which okay. comes perfectly off the tongue, doesn't it? That sounds like, dude, I'm the Star Twizzler. <laughs> now, did that come, is that the black licorice or the strawberry? Oh, my. Star Warslers. Uh, it's not... not no. Not, it's just, you know what we call ourselves? Star Wars fans, because we don't exactly. need those stinking names. Exactly. We, you know, we've never, you know, nobody has ever come up with anything that's caught, and nobody even bothers, because it. who cares? Yeah, really. Nobody gives a... I mean... Uh, pardon my slightly non-PC jargon here, but I don't think anybody gives a rat's you-know-what about the name. We just want more Star Wars. A rat's tail? Yes. Really, yeah. <laughs> nobody yes. nobody, give, yeah. nobody well, gives a rat's away. hind quarters. You know, it, but, um, <laughs> I, think, I think people learn. You get new people in at Lucasfilm and, you know, or at any other movie company, really, and, you know, you, you think, okay, well, you just... You just put it out there and, and, and the fans eat it up. And that's not true. I mean, you need to be patient with fans. You need to listen to fans. I mean, that's one of the things I prided myself on. I was, I was the voice of fandom inside Lucasfilm and the voice to fandom outside Lucasfilm. And it, both of those were as important, I think. And you, you have to let people know, well, you know, that's not going to go over really well with the fans. Or you have to tell the fans, you know, guys, you're, you're getting all anxious and upset over nothing. Trust me. And, and yeah. you have to put that trust. Yeah, And you know what? I, I hate to speak on behalf of fans but as far as this interview goes on behalf of the fans i must say you did a hell of a job well thank you i think we get uh oh i hope we didn't really lose him i think we lost him no i'm still here oh there you go whoa it that was like weird the... it's, just, it's just all that yes thunder and lightning that sand, hey, you know, Dune Sea, it happens, Sandstorm, Crate Dragon, next thing you know. You know. you know what? When you have two suns and three moons, you're bound to get interference. Right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, come on. The EMF fields must be well, good. Yeah, yeah. No wonder there's nothing there. Yeah. Well, um. you, said, <laughs> you said something very flattering, and I really appreciate it because it, it, it means a lot to me. You know, I'm still... Um, fan relations advisor to Lucasfilm. Uh, my contract got renewed again at the end of the year, so... Uh... Thank God. <laughs> I'll say it. I don't care. I'll say it. Thank God. Because you really are. You do a hell of a job. You're awesome. Well, I mean, I can't think of any other franchise, you know, other 
you know, other than the whole Star Wars that has the level of like commitment to its fans, you know, that listens to its fans. And you were the go between, so that means it's on you, which means that you did a hell of a job. Yeah, I could have really screwed it up, couldn't I? Oh, absolutely. You could be like, <laughs> hey, let's do like the Star Trek stuff. It let's call them, always, hey, let's take yeah. a page out of Doctor Who and call them Star Warsians. Yeah, yes. No, it was um it was always such a delight and and there was so much to do and uh and just you know interacting with with fandom across the world has been uh, an amazing experience just amazing and now i still get to do it through rancho obi-wan so um it's very exciting ah perfect mention a great segue because i have another question for you and this one's a little personal maybe other people want to know i'm sure there's a lot of people that would love to know certain things about rancho obi-wan but here's my question name your favorite three pieces of memorabilia in Rancho Obi Wan, and why? I usually, I usually either refuse to answer that question or say, "Okay, if you're married and have four kids, who's your favorite?" But now you ask for three. Yeah, see, I didn't go for one because I knew that that would happen, so I went for three. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I'll give you three things, and it's not that these are better than any of the others and they may be more recent than any of the others but does i never said better i just said that what you think yeah. is one of your favorites yeah just just about everything or what arrived in the mail that day yes uh, <laughs> I, 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 uh, one of the things i love just about more than anything is um fan made items because to me that shows both the skill and the passion of fans to do things. And I think, you know, I've gotten so many fan-made things over the years, but I think the thing that really set me off in that direction was from Mexico City over a decade ago, and there was a, a, a Star Wars, authorized Star Wars convention, and they had a lot of different crafts categories and awarded prizes. And this particular thing was the pinata category it was the best star wars pinata and the the prize winner was a a um, um uh, tuscan raider on a bantha and you, the bantha saddle opens you could put the toys and candy in there and of course the the tuscan was holding the gaffy stick i mean it's just an, i just looked at it and went oh my god that's incredible so i waited for the winner, he won first place, and a, a bunch of the other ones were cool, too. I waited for him to come and claim his certificate and, 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 his, and his Bantha. And uh, I just waited for about 10 minutes, and he, he came in with his wife, and I said, let, let me ask you a question. I introduced myself, and I said, you know, I've got this little museum. It's before we had incorporated or anything. And I said, mm -hmm. I would love to buy this piece from you because it really speaks to me. It, um, it's just wonderful and clever and looks great. And he said, oh, well, you know, I, I really wouldn't know how much to charge you for it. And I thought, okay, here comes the hammer. And he said, it only cost me $4 in supplies. <laughs> and I, said, I said, look, it's, it's, it's your work, it's your time, and it is your artistry that I so admire, and a lot of people would get to see it. I'd give you $100 for it, and his wife punched him in the arm and said, take it, take it. Yeah, see, Il Duce, huh? Yeah. He did, he did, he signed it for me, and we, we stayed friends, and for the Empire Strikes Back 30th anniversary, um, uh, which was uh, not that long ago in the uh, and um, we put the Bantha Pinata in the uh, Thousand Collectibles book, and he was very excited about that. And um, for the 30th anniversary of the Empire Strikes Back, his package arrives, and he had done this amazing large Luke on a Tauntaun Pinata that is Whoa. absolutely incredible, sculptural in its nature. And I mean, he has progressed so far. Um, and then I was at a convention in Mexico City just like a year ago and, and mentioned somebody asked me about my favorite pieces. And I, 
And I mentioned both of these pieces and showed pictures and he was in the audience and he was very proud. And I said, stand up and he got some uh, applause from from the crowd. So that that is clearly a very important piece to me because it's led me in in a whole different direction. And that's um, and that's fan made stuff. Then there's um, there's art. I have from the very beginning going to shows all across the country, all across the world, really looked at, you know, I, I love going to artist alleys and seeing the skill of artists back in the day, you know, a lot of them doing furtively uh, Star Wars art and sketches and things like that. And I just made it a point to connect so many of those men and women with Lucasfilm directly and with licensees, and some of them have become very well-known and very much appreciated Star Wars artists, and um, and and that to me has been a thrill. So I love uh, original Star Wars art, um, including <laughs> a piece that I bought recently on eBay that people just go crazy for her for some reason. And it is direct from Tijuana. It is an Admiral Akbar on black velvet. Yes. Black <laughs> velvet, Admiral Akbar. I'll tell you. And then there, <laughs> that's awesome. And it was uh, supposed to come in a barnwood frame. And I said to the seller, no, no, you must find me the gaudiest Tijuana gold frame that you yeah. have. Oh, I apologize, but that's uh, good. Uh, yeah, it, uh, oh, that's good. It was a big hit at Celebration. Big hit. Oh, and, man. That was pretty awesome. And then, you know, maybe number three would be um, my, my Darth Vader costume on a giant mannequin. And it's really hard to tell sometimes what's real, what was used, when, what, you know. But people these days, fans in particular, have really spent a lot of time doing research and, you know, especially you know. with the Blu-rays and, and measuring and, you know, looking at patterns and stuff. And my Vader costume was put together at three different times from auctions and sales. And we are pretty sure now, based on a number of things, that the leather undersuit, the woolen under tape and the cod piece definitely because of the costumer's tag were screen used in Star Wars. Ooh. The helmet and the mask were definitely made for and screen used in either Empire Strikes Back or one person thinks Return of the Jedi because of a, a certain kind of twist. These were the, these were all done by hand. They were not symmetrical. And so you, you really can tell the difference. And they... Yeah, for for a for a hero costume, you would make about six different costumes because you couldn't wear the thing every day. It would have to be oh, yeah. laundered and you know all this kind of stuff. So oh, and, and then the rest of the costume is uh, from a Darth Vader appearance costume, uh, probably made by ILM twenty or so years ago, and that was sort of refreshed for me by um, friends at uh, at ILM on their own time. And oh, so that's cool. it, it just looks all great together. And to know that, you know, some of these pieces at least were actually screen used in a couple of the movies is, um, is very exciting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And I got to say, I, you know, in all the like little things where they've shown like, you know, bits of film or pictures of what, you know, of, of Rancho Obi-Wan, you know, and the collection, I've seen that, the Vader costume, and I've always been like, that is the coolest thing ever. And, and that, yeah, we take a lot of pictures in front of there. We take group shots in front of there. And, uh, and, and, and then the other Vader is this huge monstrosity that was, uh, a centerpiece at Toys R Us in uh, Midtown Manhattan for years before they switched over to Clone Wars. You have that? They offered it for free to Lucasfilm. And Lucasfilm said, nah, what do we want with that? And somebody said, well, why don't you ask Steve? And I had seen it there. And it's, I mean, it's uh, eight feet, ten feet tall. And I, I said, and I said, free? 
Uh, well, uh, 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 I, yes. I, I sort of didn't ask about how it would have to be crated and shipped. And so free ended up about $5,000. Worth but it. it. It's an amazing piece. Of course, it wasn't until we spent a day and a half hanging it from the ceiling and making sure that it was all solid and had support under it that we saw some pictures and realized Toys R, Toys R Us always had it on the floor. And the things that looked like big hanging hooks were just rope to make sure it didn't fall on any of their customers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever. Yeah, I've but, actually seen that thing before, like up close and personal. Because It's an awesome piece. Yeah, where, where I lived in uh, New Jersey, up where my parents still are, I'm actually from New York City originally. And, you know, we go up there a lot. And, of course, you know, <laughs> I've always been just a big kid. I've seen the thing, and I'm like, oh, my God. Well, we you just uh, said it, and I'm like, you have that. I envy you. We uh, we spiffed it up. We cleaned it up. Um, I oh, thought it's uh, awesome. like a very heavy foam core, but it's clearly wood with like steel inside. It must weigh seven, eight hundred pounds. So, it, so wait, I was wondering that because me and my best friend actually had a debate about how they made that. So it is wood and steel. I was right. I won twenty uh, bucks. Yeah, I, I I thought it was foam, and it clearly it clearly is not hardened foam. And then we upgraded it. It had like for the silver on Vader and the grill and everything. Thing. It had, um, you know, basically silver paper, and we upgraded it with silver mirror, silver mirror acrylic, and it, it looks super. I put some red string lights behind it, so you just see some red light peeking out from it, and it, it's it's a great piece. Yeah, you know, so I cool. could I could spend hours talking about my favorite pieces. I would just walk to the museum and say, oh, "Well, and then there's." You know. <laughs> Well, maybe we can send some people your way. So we have two questions left if we can ask. Oh, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Send some people his way. I'm telling you right now, if we send anybody his way, I better be one of those people. I would give my left one to well, be in that for five well, minutes. Well, sign up, sign up for a membership and well, they go. Oh, I have to. to. All you need to do is go to www.RanchoObiWan.org. And it, we give you all the description of, of what a tour is. It's, it's not like a normal museum. What a tour consists of is me leading the groups and telling you all about the backstories behind things, behind how the movies were made, what this prop is, how this came about. Um, and so it's like a two to three hour guided tour of the collection. Sometimes it actually even oh, okay i have to sign there. up for this because that right there would be the best three hours of my life and, and then we have just you know we have a we have an initial level membership kit uh, every year and that consists of an exclusive patch and letter and membership card so like that. that's patch. A, we are a a non-profit 501c3 and um and none of the money that we raise uses to to buy stuff for the collection it all goes for maintenance and utility bills and things like that. Uh, just yes, sort of to make sure that people can keep on seeing it and that it stays where it is and it exists absolutely in the best way that it can. And you know what? That's a good cause. So, so does this mean you have to prepare a new wing now for a new Star Wars everything that's going to explode? In the <laughs> that's game? great. New Star Wars everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think my head's going to explode first because um, uh, it's. Uh, now we we expanded the museum two years ago with with the idea of opening up to the public and becoming a nonprofit and um, and I must say that depleted almost all of my assets um, and uh, I, there, I just don't know where the space is much less the money for uh, for seven okay. eight nine and whatever else comes along but um, I don't know maybe we'll dig some trenches or. Maybe start a Kickstarter. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Hey, Kickstarter's no. <laughs> getting fun, man. That's, that's how Pink 5 got their funding to oh, finish I, that up. Believe me, I know. I was, you know, I said, Trey, if you don't finish this now, you know, yeah, I contributed 150 bucks to that. I want to see it finished. <laughs> Yeah, man, we were and it's the heck out. soon. So yeah, no, Trey's a great guy, and I just always remember. And you know, okay, okay well, we're going to show part two of episode ma at, at you know, and and Trey, you know, where's Trey? I don't know. The show's starting in five minutes. Trey, where, no, oh, he, he's on his way. I mean, he's just like he's stuck in traffic. He's just driving down now from L.A. Oh well, yeah, he just finished. It. <laughs> <laughs> 
really? So it was like really one of those kind of like right on the skin yeah. of the teeth things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We never had a chance to preview it, make sure it played OK or anything else. Uh, just, just shove it in and hope for the best. Yeah. yeah so. So I have a question here from a fan that if I don't ask, he, he might get mad. So this question has to do with being content and so on. He says, do you find that keeping track of the ever-expanding Star Wars universe has become much harder over time? Or do you have any secrets um, on how to stay on top of it? Since you did write the encyclopedia and so on, so how do you stay on top of everything as it expands? I stay on top of it by writing encyclopedias and then forgetting everything. And then having and that's a, why you write encyclopedias. As a source. Yeah, well, I couldn't have done the most recent encyclopedia, which is three volumes, 1.1 million words, without the huge help of Pablo Hidalgo and a number of of other uh, well-known names in Star Wars, uh, in Star Wars writing, like Dan Wallace and and uh, Bob Vetus and his online Star Wars, uh, unofficial Star Wars encyclopedia. It was a massive effort, and it would have been impossible for one person to do it. What I did was sort of write through everything to give it one voice, one feel. Uh, uh, but golly, I mean, we thought it was going to be one thick volume and then very clearly said uh, Random House uh, is going to be two volumes. And then Pablo and I were still working on our first letters. And Pablo said, I don't know about you, but this is coming in like three or four times the size. And that's, <laughs> that's when we went back to Random House and said, three volumes um so yeah it's my heaviest book yeah and i and so another one of my friends actually owns that and i got to leave through it wow somebody once told me that they read it from cover to cover and to cover to cover to cover, to cover. i read the original from cover to cover but the new one's really big it's huge <laughs> Well, the, the original one I wrote myself completely, and it's actually one of the reasons I left the Wall Street Journal and joined Lucasfilm, because the Lucasfilm job was basically going out on a Friday doing fan events on Saturday and Sunday and coming home either Sunday night or Monday. And meanwhile, I was at the Journal. I was beer chief at the time, and I was trying to do the encyclopedia, uh, at, at, you know, on deadline. And it wasn't getting done because it was such even that was a massive amount of work. And so, um, you know, one of the at least one of the things I used to convince myself was, oh, well, I'll be able to finish the encyclopedia. But uh, it, it's that way when you approach any book. I mean, usually you you don't think of the pain. And I, I, I'm told it's sort of like what women go through is, uh, on childbirth, which is, <laughs> you know, an extremely painful thing. But then. You sort of forget yes. that part of it, and and so you're willing to have another child. Well, you know, sort of forgot that part of it both both with this second encyclopedia and also with the the newest book, the um, the um, the uh, ultimate action figure collection that has 2,300 separate figures in there. And talk about migraine inducing that was oh my god you know that's that's the kind of book you say never again and then three years <laughs> that's the kind of thing where you didn't ask for the size of tech. and now the and now the black collection just came out yeah oh lord Dude, <laughs> are you trying to get the man a coronary jeremiah yeah. come on oh that they the the initial they look great. really really cool i'm i'm six inches my goodness yeah i i excuse me are you bragging or something what was that <laughs> Ever. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Uh, wind up there. Huh? Yeah, no, just, just... <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a second. He's in college. He understands that stuff. No, yes, I, yes, I, I no, I had heard about the black collection. This was the first. Uh, this is the first photos I had seen of it. It looks great. I'm very excited about that. So here's our last question. Every guest we ever have on the show, at the very end, we always give them a, the opportunity to have the soapbox. So you can. Talk to the fans of Bombard Radio. Talk to the listeners. Tell them whatever you want. Promote whatever you want. You can even just sit there and rant. You, the soapbox is yours to tell whatever you want to the listeners of Bombard Radio. Soapbox is yours. Go for wow. it. Wow. Um, Star Wars fandom has been so important to me. It, it, there is not another series of movies that I can think of that that really has bound the universe together for so many people. 
And when you see a second and a third generation, when you see somebody like J.J. Abrams, who was inspired to get into making films because of Star Wars, I think it is the most incredible community. And I have such great hopes of it continuing long, long into the future. And you know what, guys? There are a lot of people out there who, you know, sometimes spew nonsense and, and raise ridiculous questions and are negative about things that they really don't know what they're talking about. But I guess I've learned that we have to accept it all. It's a huge community. George has created an amazing sandbox for all of us to play in. So let's have fun and let's be happy about it and let's just play. We love you, Uncle George. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's something like, you, you're the best person to say that. Yeah, really. Thank coming you. from you, it's like you heard that. So now you can <laughs> calm down, everybody. Relax. You just heard it from the horse's mouth. So, you know, let's all get along and just keep having fun. Cause that's what it's all about. Absolutely. And well, we like to thank you for being on the show. You've given us, you've answered all of our questions. You've given us amazing stories. And of course, We'll thank Consetta for her wonderful help with us because she is always great. Oh, she, we love Consetta. We're very lucky to have her. We really are. Jeremiah, awesome. it's been uh, it's been great talking to you both. Anytime. 